or maybe you can uh, get ready and uh, you can share your screen with uh, us. I think I think the host should unshare. Yeah, now I can share. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's see whether it works. Uh, do you see my screen now? Yes, yes, everything is okay. Perfect. So I will start as soon as you tell me to start. Well, I think it's time. I don't see the countdown anymore because there is this uh, shared screen, but I think we can start. So everybody, welcome to our session. We have uh, six uh, sub-sessions in our one-hour session. So the first one is devoted to the paper logical characterization of hybrid conformance, and it will be presented by Mohamed. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, so this is joint work with Maciek Gazda and uh, myself. Maciek is from University of Sheffield. And the actual presentation is given by Maciek. Uh, and this is also representative of the amount of work that uh, we have contributed. So probably Maciek has spent like 30 times uh, more time than, than I did. And, and uh, the credit goes to him. Of course, the remaining mistakes in, in, these, in this short presentation is definitely mine. So what I will do, I will just give you a very brief overview of, of uh, our results and also a little bit of background for those of you who know, do not know much about um, this field. So uh, we have presented what uh, we think is the first characterization result uh, for an approximate notion of conformance for hybrid systems. So uh, for example, the Alfaro, uh, Stuhling uh, and, and Associates, they, they have a logical characterization for metric uh, transition systems. But to our knowledge, there has not been any notion of uh, any logical characterization for, for uh, hybrid systems and hybrid label transition systems so far. And this is the first one in the literature that we are aware of. Um, in order to achieve that, we uh, extended the semantic notions uh, available to a new semantic notion that can, can capture both discretized and continuous systems. So you can have um, infinitary and even uncountable number of states in your system because that's necessary for, for uh, capturing continuous semantics. And also we had to extend the semantics of metric temporal logic, which I will briefly mention in the remainder of this short presentation. So in order to give you a little bit of background about this research, this is about testing. Uh, and, and typically when you're testing a system, you deal with the upper, upper part of this picture where you have a test model you generate test cases from that, you run it on the system in the test and you analyze the outcome and you loop here until you're satisfied uh, with the quality or you find a counterexample showing that the system fails. And in order to, uh, to ground that on a, a mathematical uh, and rigorous ground, uh, typically you define something called a conformance relation. So a conformance relation is basically a mathematical characterization of your notion of correctness. And that's why giving that's defined by giving a semantics to your test model and also a purported semantics for the system on the test which is which is very difficult to generate impossible to generate for real systems but then you define a conformance relation which defines what notions what kind of deviations are acceptable and what kind of deviations should be considered a failure and the notion that we have been considering for hybrid system is called tau epsilon conformance we have a tool that we have been working on for the past four or five years uh, for, for this notion. The notion is not ours, it's uh, due to people at Arizona State University. And it's a very simple notion. Assume that the blue line is your specification and the black line is your implementation. We say that these two trajectories are tau epsilon closed when for every point in the blue line, there is a point in the black line that is at most epsilon apart in value and at most tau apart in time. Uh, and vice versa, of course, this, this is defined to be symmetric. Uh, and we have applied this notion to many, many different examples. So the, these are links to two recent papers on, um, on uh, connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, so what we have been doing is to characterize this notion of conformance. And if you, had, if you were dealing with uh, an exact notion of conformance, the logical characterization would look like this. You fix a logic L and this logic characterizes your, your conformance if and only if all pro uh, when all properties are preserved and reflected, then uh, the, the conformance holds. In this setting, it's a slightly more difficult because we are dealing with an approximate notion of conformance and hence we need a slightly different type of characterization. The logic that we have chosen and it has, was already hinted in the literature is metric temporal logic. It's a variant of temporal logic that uh, uh, 
is annotated with intervals that specify when a certain thing should happen in terms of time. Uh, and of course, you can, you can define things like box and finally, uh, so uh, globally and finally using until and release. Um, and the logical characterization theorem now looks like this. So we say uh, a logic L characterizes this notion of tau epsilon conformance whenever for all formulae in this logic, if P satisfies phi, then Q satisfies a relaxed version of phi. And the main um, crux of our result is to define the right relaxation that both reflects and preserves uh, the logical properties. So to summarize again, we have what we believe is the first logical characterization result for an approximate notion of conformance for hybrid systems. This involved a couple of extensions to both the semantic domain and also to sem the semantics of metric temporal logic. And thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer questions. Okay, so thanks a lot for the presentation. So now questions. As far as I can see, there are no questions on the Zoom chat. And uh, nor on the Slack, if I'm not mistaken. So anybody is uh, willing already to ask a question, uh, an online question? So if not, then let me ask a question. So as, I, as far as I managed to understand your, your, your talk, so we basically concentrate on individual runs. So you have a specification, the desired run, then you have the actual run of the system and you compare them. So in this context, I mean, is there any space for you know, branching time logics and uh, considering like branching time behavior of systems or is it completely relevant or inappropriate in this context? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I simplified a little bit. So it's a hybrid system in our definition is a function from the initial conditions and uh, the inputs to outputs. So you uh, are comparing actually sets of trajectories that are parameterized by the initial conditions and inputs, right? So it's not a single trajectory that you're comparing. I simplified it in my presentation. Uh, so you already have some notion of non-determinism captured, but a linear notion of non-determinism that is captured, and it's also uh, uh, treated quite extensively in the paper. But uh, you are indeed right. So, so uh, there is a scope for considering uh, branching notions of conformance, which is not the case here, and then uh, considering also branching logics. And as far as I know, there is no such result in the literature. So all of this is, is uncharted territory. Okay. Thanks. So then there's a question from uh, uh, from uh, Rupak. So Rupak, if you are online, would you like to state your question, you know, uh, by yourself, or you want um, me to read it? Sure. Um, yep. At some point, uh, we had a result on logical characterizations when two traces were related by scorecard distance. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we, are, we actually refer to your work quite extensively and and, and uh, compare it with our work. Uh, yes, yeah, so you have a preservation result, which um, is which inspired our our our, um, uh, uh, our characterization as well. But you don't have a reflex the reflection side of the result. So and 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 the main difficulty we, we use actually the no different notion of conformance. So we use tau epsilon, use a score code, which is um, interesting because the score code seems to be more difficult to characterize than <laughs> than. Uh, than tau, tau epsilon and you use freeze temporal logic, we use metric temporal logic. So these are the differences, but uh, you have preservation. And in order to get reflection, you need to find very tight relaxation so that it's just uh, relaxed enough to, to, to uh, characterize the, the notion of conformance. I don't know whether I answered Thank the question. You. Yeah, I, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, anything else? Yeah, there is a question. From Felix. So, Felix, if you are online, then please uh, speak up. I actually didn't ask the question. This is just copied in from Slack. It's from Andre Blatzer. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, so from so Andre says that uh, okay, very interesting talk. What is the relation to Cursell's bridging, e.g., in formats eleven or his PhD thesis? So that's the question. Sorry, I can't see the. Question. Is there any way I can? I, I, I didn't catch the names, so uh, let me see whether I can find it in the chat. You can read the question in the Zoom chat if you want. So I'm afraid I don't know this work. I don't know whether Maciek knows about this work. I have to look it up. I don't know, actually. Okay, so uh, Maciek, would you like to add anything? Uh, 
So I think we have to look it up and then okay. uh, respond on, on the Slack. I'm afraid I don't know it on top of my head. Okay, so anything else? Any other question? So if not, then uh, thank you very much. And uh, we can go on. So uh, Pascal, you. this is your turn. Uh, Mohamed, I just would like to ask you to stop sharing the screen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Let me... Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm presenting our paper, The Complexity of Bounded Context Switching with Dynamic Thread Creation in very condensed form now due to the time limit. And uh, this is a collaboration with Rupak Majumdar, Ramana Tantinyam, and Georg Zetsche. And we all work at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. So... Um, the model we are uh, reasoning about in our paper is this uh, dynamic networks of concurrent pushdown systems, abbreviated DCPS. And uh, it's used to model concurrent recursive threads. So we have these threads that each have a stack to model uh, recursive procedure calls, and they are concurrent. And in fact, um, we can context switch between these at any time. So these are the inactive threads here, and this is the active one, but only up to a bound K to avoid undecidability. And uh, the number of context switches that each thread has made is saved in a number here for each of these threads. And um, we also have a finite global memory uh, here um, represented by global state G. So we have a finite set of global states and all threads can access this um, by being the active thread and then making push down transitions that depend on this global state. And uh, during these push down transitions, we can also always spawn new threads. So they will look like this, just one symbol and the context switch number zero. And this bag here is uh, of unlimited size. So um, we can always spawn new threads and then switch to them later. And for this model, um, we consider safety verification. And the problem that we're looking at for this is the K-bounded state reachability problem for DCPS. So um, with a DCPS and a global state as input, the question is whether you can reach that uh, bounded st uh, the global state while staying uh, or respecting this bound k on the context switches. So this is parameterized by k, this problem. And in the, um, in the literature, there are uh, two main results on this. So for k equal to zero, this is known to be x-space complete, as was shown by Pierre Ganti and Rupak in an earlier paper in 2012. And um, for k greater or equal to one, uh, there's a complexity gap, or there was a complexity gap. Uh, namely, it was x space hard and into a x space. And this was shown by Artik Rajani and Kadir already in 2009. And our main result is now that this is also two x space hard for k greater or equal to one. So we close this complexity gap that's present here showing two x space completeness essentially. And our proof is to uh, reduce from coverability for transducer defined battery nets. So this is the, a new model that we introduced for this purpose. It's, uh, it's a succinct representation of battery nets. Um, and for this, we use some novel techniques. And so this is basically the main part of the paper. But then, of course, we also have to prove that the coverability for this type of succinctness is actually a 2x base hard, so one exponent higher than for regular Petri nets. And for this, we adapt the Lipton construction that showed this for regular Petri nets. And, uh, we also use another new model, um, recursive net programs here in between to show this. And then we have this three-step reduction to our main problem. And that is uh, basically all that I wanted to say here. So any questions? 
Okay, thanks a lot. So indeed, it's time for questions. So is there any question? There's nothing on the Slack and... Okay, so, so let me start. So I was wondering, since the main result uh, of your paper is the lower bound, so mm -hmm. do you think that there is any way how to constrain the problem so that it still remains sort of interesting, but the complexity becomes uh, lower? So there's um, actually uh, in, in this paper, there is um, sort of a, a restricted version of this uh, problem. Namely, um, what they're considering is that threads don't spawn with a zero, but they spawn with their parents context switch number plus one. And then you can sort of first handle all the threads with context switch number zero, then all the ones with one, then all the ones with two, and so on. And this is called stratified reachability. And I think, I don't remember the exact complexity class this was in, but it was much lower than 2x space. I don't think it was even uh, x space, like something below that. But yeah, I don't, I don't quite remember the exact result. Okay, good. That answers my question. So is there any other question? Well, I mean, the message is pretty, pretty clear. I mean, you solve an open problem, you close the complexity gap. That's, that's okay, that's fine. Yeah. Very clear. So if uh, there is no other questions, so thanks for the presentation and uh, we can go on. So the next speaker is uh, David. So David, it's uh, your turn now. So you can see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, we were looking at the complexity of verifying programs as differential, differentially private. Uh, this is work with Marco Gaboadi and Kobe, Kobe Nissen. Uh, so we start with uh, loop-free programs with finite memory. Um, so here we presented it as Boolean programs, but you can also add integers up to finite memory. And uh, immediately we discard this really and consider um, the case of randomized circuits uh, as an equivalent model of the program. Uh, so a randomized circuit is just a standard Boolean circuit, but some of the inputs are decided by coin flips rather than input. And so on any given input that induces a uh, probability distribution over the output. Um, and then we want to check whether this program is differentially private. Um, so it's differentially private if when you have two inputs, um, these inputs should be neighboring in the sense that you want it to be difficult to distinguish whether the input was this input or that input, uh, and therefore maintaining the privacy of those two inputs, you want this particular inequality to hold. Um, so this says that the probability of seeing any output from input one is very close to the input from input two, and this is related with this parameter epsilon and delta. And this gives rise to the question of asking whether the program or the circuit has this. So for a given epsilon and a given delta, does it satisfy this level of differential privacy? Um, and we show that for epsilon differential privacy, which is when delta is set to zero, the problem is cohen p with a sharp p oracle complete, which is equivalently cohen p with a pp oracle. Um, and for epsilon delta differential privacy, we show between cohen p with a sharp p oracle and cohen p with a sharp p oracle, where that sharp p oracle itself has access to a sharp p oracle. Um, so this is kind of negative news because it's reasonably high in the counting hierarchy. And what we kind of expected that was, sure, this might be hard to decide, but that approximating the parameters, so given uh, the system, or given the program, and given one of the two parameters, can you approximate the optimal or smallest value of the other? We thought that might be uh, maybe polynomial time approximable, uh, but we show it's not. So it's NP hard to approximate uh, these parameters, um, which was further bad news. Um, so that's what we did and I'm happy to take any questions. So 
Any questions from the audience? Okay, so let me start. So we have two questions. So the first of them is related to the result itself. So I'm not completely sure how to understand that because you say that, okay, epsilon differential privacy is going to be to sharp P complete. Now, how about does it depend on the epsilon itself? Is it, uh, does it go for every epsilon or? So for every epsilon other than zero. So asking if okay. it's zero differentially private is essentially asking if the two probability distributions are equal. And this uh, is, a slightly lower complexity class. So instead of sharp P, you can replace it with exact half P sat, uh, half, half sat, um, but it's very close. But for any epsilon, and then um, obviously the epsilon delta result, when delta is set to zero, then it's in cohen P with sharp P oracle, that's by definition, but for any delta just slightly larger than zero, then uh, we can't show it's in cohen P with a sharp P oracle. Mm-hmm. Okay, and my second question was, I mean, you consider programs without any kind of loops and go-tos, so, I mean, is there a way how to extend the results, at least with some restricted form of uh, a loop, like a... So, uh, intuitively, <laughs> if uh, we... So, I mean, it needs to be in some way finite, in a sense, so we work in a finite input space or finite memory space. So if we have this and it's, uh, we could introduce loops because you would still be able to do total exhaustion and you would notice that you've seen a state to get before. Um, we hypothesize that this problem is probably in P space, but we haven't been able to show it yet. Uh-huh. Um, it's, I mean, almost certainly in X space because you can just write every possible input output. Okay. so. Um... Anything else? Any other question? Well, it seems we are done. So thanks a lot. So um, now I ask Radek to take over and uh, present the results. So it's time games and deterministic, deterministic separability. Okay, so let me set up my slides first. Okay. Do you see the first slide? Yes, we see the first slide. I was hoping for some uh, animation, but okay, slide is also okay. All right, so let's begin. Uh, I should warn you that you should fasten your seat belts because I will try to squeeze one third of my video into two or three minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, in my video, I answered three questions about our work. And uh, the first answer in, in a nutshell was uh, that we generalized the synthesis problem for the setting of time automata. And we also proved an analog of the Bichel and Weber theorem in our setting. And my graphic depiction of the synthesis problem was as follows. We are given some green machine, a specification, that reads an infinite input word. And when it reads it all at the doomsday, it either accepts it or rejects. Part of the word is generated on the fly by a letter to letter transducer. And now the question is whether there exists a transducer that always makes the green machine happy. All this can be rephrased in the language of game theory. Now there's a winning condition here, player called controller and the player called input. In a single turn, the input player produces a letter and based on that, the controller needs to respond. Bichit and Weber theorem says that when the condition is omega regular, then we may effectively solve the problem of existence of a strategy for the controller that wins against every possible input. And what we did, we generalized that to the setting of timed automata. So now in the time synthesis games, uh, the letters in the input arrive in some time offsets one from another. For example, the input player might produce the next letter here. To handle this, uh, the devices on the left are given clocks. For example, 
uh, the control when I measure that the letter A arrived uh, in some offset uh, somewhere between five and six. Then it may use the readings from the clock to produce an answer. So this is, th those are our games. And now our synthesis problem differs in three places from the standard one. Uh, Time to omega regular languages are not close under the complement, so, so we may want to specify the winning condition either for the first player or the second player. Secondly, there are some constants related to the clocks, which we may want to fix or not. Uh, the table of the previous results look as looks as follows. The middle row here was not considered before, but some of its cells can be filled quite easily. The rightmost one turned out to be non-trivial. In our paper, we provide these three results. The one, the, the one that is most important is this here. Our theorem states that the time synthesis problem can be solved without specifying the constants that are used by the clocks up front. Only the number of clocks has to be given. So now I have briefly summarized the answers for the two questions here. Our results can be applied to solve the deterministic separability question for the time totometer. Basically, what we need to do, uh, we use those um, two decidability results to, to solve the separability problem. So this is all for now. Thank you for your attention. OK, so thanks for the presentation. Questions? Okay, so again, let me start. So, uh, in your presentation, you said uh, some, uh, I mean, you presented the decidability results, but uh, you have not said anything about the complexity. So, can you comment a little bit on this? So... Well, certainly the complexity is high. We did not focus that much on the complexity itself. Actually, I think we want to look at this more thoroughly in the future. But I think it, it will be very, very high. I mean, something like a Kerman function. Uh -huh. so, so I was wondering, so what is the proof technique beyond this decidable result? So are the results uh, like constructive? Uh, so do you really produce the, so can you produce yes, yes, yes. the induced that exists? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh, yes, we actually can produce those uh, oh. controllers here. And I mean, yeah, okay, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. so essentially what we do, we reduce those problems. I mean, we first reduce this one to this one, and then we reduce this one uh, to the original uh, Bichland Weber setting. Mm -hmm. Then my second question was, whether you have uh, any idea how many clocks uh, are needed. I mean, if there is a, a transducer with uh, finitely many clocks, then is there an upper bound on the number of uh, the clocks? So yeah, yeah, yeah. there is some upper bound. Uh, we can derive that from the Bichian van Weber theorem, but actually we don't have a lower bound now. We don't have any examples that actually needs a large number of clocks. So uh, we showed that this is decidable, but we don't know if our solution is optimal. Perhaps uh, fewer clocks can be uh -huh. used. OK, so then there is a question from Rupak. I mean, he also asked about the complexity. So yeah, it was the same question. And there is a question from Lorenzo. So Lorenzo, if you are online, then please speak up. Okay, so maybe I will read the question. So, so no, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So please I go was ahead. Not prepared to speak. Yeah, I have a very bad connection, I'm afraid, uh, <laughs> of speaking. So the question is whether Radek knows how to solve the main open problem that you left in the paper, which is deciding deterministic separability for tend automata when the number of clocks of the separator is not fixed in advance, as we do now, but is unspecified. Quantified existential. 
Sorry, Lorenzo, can you repeat? I did not catch the second part of your question. As I said, they have a bad audio. That's why I wrote the question in the chat. <laughs> okay, so let me look at the chat because I had something else on my screen right now. And I still can't, I don't know how to open the chat because. Right, oh, so I say again. So, Radek, yeah, so mm -hmm. maybe you can help. So, uh, the question is. Uh, whether you could solve the main open problem that is deciding the deterministic separability problem for time to automata. Oh, so, uh, yeah, as I said in the video, those uh, two variants of separability uh, here are approachable using our techniques, but we don't know what to do here. And uh, Lorenzo, one of my co authors, is now asking if I had some new ideas about that, and no, actually, the answer is still negative. Okay. Good. Uh, any other question? Okay. So it seems we are done. So thanks a lot. Thank you, too. Uh, if you want, I can show you my secrets about my video production techniques. I have one slide. About that. But, so. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I think we can afford that because we are somehow we are yet enough time. So if it's just a slide, then uh, I think everybody would be interested. So please go ahead. So actually, my pipeline was uh, as follows. So I prepared some drawings in some nice vector uh, graphic editor, and then I used PowerPoint to animate them. I transferred the output of the PowerPoint to open broadcaster software. And I also recorded myself at, uh, with a green screen background. And this software combined those two video streams. And I had a live preview of how the output looks like. And uh, here I have two pictures. So this is the program that I have drawn my pictures with, and this is my studio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you just made your video with a, with a smartphone, so that's amazing. I mean, there's no- No, actually, actually the smartphone was connected to my laptop, but oh, it had okay. better camera than the built-in camera of my laptop. Okay. So thanks a lot for sharing also uh, this part of, uh, the, of your secrets. So now, okay, we can uh, we can go on uh, with the next talk. So it's uh, Pierre's uh, I need to turn start now. Sharing yeah, please, please stop sharing so that we can pass the document to Pierre. Okay, thanks a lot. So Pierre. Okay. So you yeah, see okay. my screen now? Okay, yeah, we can see. Okay. So this is a joint work with uh, Ami uh, Paz, who is currently in Vienna, and it's about uh, distributed computing and a topological uh, formulation of uh, distributed computing. So um, the, uh, the distributed computing is essentially, as you may know already, that you have a set of autonomous processes, P1 to Pn, and you have some communication medium, and they exchange information via, via this communication medium. And they want to solve tasks. So a task is essentially every process got an input, let's say Xi for, for process Pi, and every process Pi has to eventually output some value, uh, Yi. And to be correct, there is some uh, specification of the task, some input-output relation delta that is that essentially tells for each input vector, x1 up to xn, all the set of uh, legal output vectors y1 to yn for this specific uh, input vector. So the one of the main achievements at the beginning of, the, of this century was to formalize uh, distributed computation using a topological framework. And this is a presentation based on the framework uh, set up by Early and Shavit, who got the, the Godel Prize for uh, their study of this framework in the, in the context of shared memory computing with crash failures. And essentially, what is this picture about? 
So this, uh, all these objects here, I, P, T, and O, they are simply shell complexes. So each simplex in this, for instance, uh, complex I, each simplex is just a collection of legal input configuration. So each simplex is one possible legal configura input configuration of the system. And of course, there could be many uh, input, uh, legal input configuration of the system. The complex O is the complex where, where each simplex is uh, an output, a legal output configuration. And the complex is formed for, for all the simplices, all the possible uh, legal output configuration. And the before can be represented by a carrier map from the uh, input complex to the output complex. So in the diagonal here, I delta O represents the specification of the task you want to solve. Now, when the computation takes place, the processes start to communicate. And by communicating, the input complex is uh, uh, transformed to what is called the protocol complex. So, so after some time, T, the computer you end up with the protocol complex at time T, which essentially is a picture, is a photo, which represents each simplex is every possible uh, uh, global legal global state of the system at time t. And all these global uh, states together, they form the pro protocol complex T. And this uh, function, uh, xi t, Okay, so I, I'm afraid that we lost the connection. Is that right? I mean, or can you can you hear anything? Uh, no, I think you're right. Maybe you want to move to the next speaker, and uh, I'll talk to Pierre and see what to do in a few minutes. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So I'll call him. Yeah. Okay, so so if you can. Uh, approach him that would be nice so maybe yeah, he can uh, he can uh, uh, again uh, restart uh, his presentation at the end of the session so in between uh, we would uh, so i would like to ask uh, niels to present uh, his work okay uh, so one moment okay so i hope you can all see my screen now Yes, everything is okay. Okay, so we are interested in uh, maintaining the graph reachability query dynamically. So we have a changing input graph. And for this input graph, we store some auxiliary information, which includes the transitive closure of our graph. And when our graph changes, then we update the auxiliary information, including the transitive closure. And we do this again after every change of our graph. And of course, the idea is that this update of the auxiliary information is in some way simpler than just to compute the transitive closure from scratch after every change of the graph. We work in the DNF O setting introduced by Patnak and Immermann in the 90s. And in the setting, this update of auxiliary data is expressed using first order logic. So as an example, if we have an input graph and its transitive closure, then after an edge insertion, the updated transitive closure relation T is expressed uh, based on its old version from this first order formula that tells us that after the insertion of an edge UV, there's a path from X to Y in the changed graph, if such a path existed before, or if there was a path from X to U and from V to Y. So 
we know that reachability isn't enough O, so can be maintained using first order updates after changes for acyclic graphs and for undirected graphs. And at iCard five years ago, it was shown that it can also be maintained for all directed graphs. If the change that happens at each point of time is the insertion or the deletion of a single edge. At iCalp two years ago, we could extend that to changes of a non constant number of edges at each point of time, namely log n over log log n many edges. And if you want to allow insertions and deletions of a polylogarithmic number of edges at each point, then you can do that using if your updates are allowed to use additional majority quantifiers. So in a sense, um, you have here TC0 updates, while here you have AC0 updates. Now this year, we show that uh, for undirected graphs, we can maintain reachability in DIN FO under insertions of polylogarithmically many edges. So we were uh, able to reduce the complexity here. And this can be transferred to directed graphs if we only allow edge insertions and no edge deletions at all. And for some classes of directed graphs, we can also maintain reachability under insertions and deletions of polylogarithmically many edges if we allow our updates to use additional modulo two quantifiers instead of the majority quantifiers we had before. And this theorem, for example, applies to the class of planar graphs. And we show that it also applies to the class of graphs or to all classes of graphs with bounded tree width. And we also show that within our complexity bound, we cannot maintain reachability under changes that have larger size than polylogarithmic. So our, our results are in some sense optimal with respect to the size of the changes that we can handle. Yeah, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Okay, thanks a lot. So are there any questions? So I just have a naive one. So you have uh, been talking about uh, insertion and deletion of edges. So in this context, does it make any sense to consider also insertion and deletion of uh, nodes? Like if you delete the node with all adjacent uh, edges, uh, does it make any sense in this context? Yeah, it does. So. Um... So usually in the standard O setting, the number of nodes stays the same. It's just that defined that way. There is a close um, setting which also um, allows insertion and deletions of nodes. It's called the Foyer setting, introduced by Dongsu and Topor. And basically, our results translate there. It's translate to this setting. There are some technical things that you need to consider there. So for example, yeah, you need, so you, if you get a bunch of new nodes, then this change only need also needs to give you a linear order on these nodes and something like that. So you need some additional information on these nodes that you insert, but then it works fine. Okay, thanks. So any other question? Well, if not, then maybe we are done with uh, your talk. Thanks again, thanks. So now uh, I think it's time to reconnect uh, with uh, Pierre. So uh, Ami, do you have any news or how is the situation? Yeah, I'm, I'm reconnected, but I don't know if my connection will be good enough. So let's try again maybe. Uh, okay, so let's do it. Hopefully. Okay. Let's try again. Uh, okay. So I was here. So trying to explain this picture about the input complex, the output complex, and the task specification. And the important Things is that the protocol complex here, this complex here, represents 
the way the uh, information flow in the among the, the, the processes. So uh, this the first when you want to model the, uh, the, 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 the distributed computing using topology, you have first to understand what is this protocol complex. Because the crucial thing is that there is uh, an algorithm for solving your task. If and only if there is a simplicial map from the protocol complex to the output complex. So the tasks, the, 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 the main uh, things to remember in the topological framework of distributed computing is that the task IO delta is solvable if and only in time t, if and only if there exists a simplicial map delta from the protocol complex to the output complex that of course and this framework was successively uh, successfully applied to a large class of models. it seems we've lost pierre again yes uh, maybe i can try to replace him okay if this works for you. Uh, okay. Do you see my screen? Because I don't see any. Yes, yes, we, yes, we do. Yes, <laughs> okay. So basically what we did in this work is take the framework of Hurley and Shavit. They use uh, this framework for multi topology. Basically you have input complex representing the system at the beginning of the computation, the output after you produce an output, and then the computation is this mapping from the input to the protocol complex representing the system after communicating. And the question of having an algorithm boils down to having uh, this uh, mapping between two simplicial complexes. So the main idea is to capture the whole system using one object of simplicial complex at each point in time. Now their work and works that followed had to do with all-to-all -all communication networks, usually with asynchrony and failures. And actually, in a, so uh, what we did in la last year in Sirocco was to show that this actually works also for non-complete networks. So you'd like to model things like the local model using the same from, uh, framework of algebraic topology. And we managed to do this in the previous work, but this was with Castaneda et al. But this was a bit limited because it had to do uh, only with tasks like consensus and so on. But in the local model, other models of distributed computing, you care about problems in networks, say coloring or others. And this, the current work that you can see here on the right, we have a new approach, we call the lo local approach, where you can model uh, problems that are much more local. Like in coloring, you care only about your own uh, color and the colors of your neighbors in a network if you want to find a proper coloring of the nodes in a network. And so here we can model also these kind of questions that are much more local in networks that are not all to all communication. And the main advantage of this is that the simplicial complexes in hand are much smaller. They no, no longer have size that depends on n, the number of nodes in the system, but instead they, they depend on uh, delta, the highest, uh, or D in this slide, the highest degree of a node. So we still have simplicial complexes that can, they grow, but now they, their size depends on the degree and the number of round, communication rounds in a synchronous network. And this model we hope will allow to uh, do much better uh, this computer aided verification because algebraic topology methods were used before for this, but it's very problematic if you depend on the number of nodes that can grow very, very fast. But if you depend only, sorry, it can be very large. But if you depend only on the degrees of the nodes or their, uh, the number of rounds, then maybe you are be much better. Uh, so this is like in very high level what we did. Uh, sorry for the disconnections with Pierre. Okay, so the, oh, sorry. So the, uh, this is the slide. Uh, so the global approach is what we did in the previous and this, the local approach is the current uh, work. And I think I'll stop here. Okay, uh, thanks a I'll lot. I'll try to take questions, but uh, yeah. Yeah, indeed, question time.
So when I was watching your full presentation, I mean, there was a result like a lover bound mentioning that the reduction from C coloring to three coloring requires there was some like omega log C uh, time if I'm, or, or, or iterations of this algorithm. So do you have any more results of this kind? Like, uh, can you prove more lover bounds using your approach? So, I mean, that's a very good question. Well, just like in the first paper, we proved mainly for consensus and set of game, and here we use, I mean, we only look in this coloring. The major, one of the major open questions in the distributed computing in general is proving lower bounds, say, for the local model, for coloring specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have upper bounds that are improving over time, but now it's like a log n, the time for coloring a graph with the delta plus one coloring. But the lower bound is log star n since 1992. And there was no advance on the lower bound side. So we really hope this approach will help to show lower bounds for coloring in general setting. But no, we don't have this result yet. One of the major open questions for us as well, if this topology framework and specifically the local uh, topology framework could be useful for this. Okay, thanks. So are there any other questions on the Slack? I cannot see anything. Any other live question? Maybe I have a small question. Yes. Uh, is this topological uh, approach suited only for synchronous communications or for synchronous uh, algorithms? Or is it also used for asynchronous communication? Hmm. Oh, that's a very good question. Actually, in the beginning, the Herlian Chavit was for asynchronous uh, systems with failures. And there you have one kind of topological deformation, which is a subdivision, subdivisions we know from algebraic topology. For uh, networks with synchronous uh, communication, we have a new kind of subdivisions with, uh, of deformation that we call scissor cuts. And what you're asking is basically, can we take both the network, which is not all to all communicate. So if you're just asked about all to all, but asynchrony, then this was solved by Helen Chavit. But if you want both a network, which is not all to all and asynchrony, this will require a combination of the two methods. And we really hope this could be done. We believe this can be done, but this was not done yet. So in theory, yeah, we could use the same approach of algebraic topology to encapsulate both distances and not all to all communication, but the network and asynchrony. Thanks, yeah, this was the question. Thanks. Okay, okay then we have uh, one more question from uh, Andrea and one more potential question from Fabian. So Andrea, if you are online, then please uh, ask a question. Uh, wait, um, hi. I think it's my question actually that she put on ah, the- Okay, okay, so go ahead. So I think I can ask the question. Yes. Uh, is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so hi, Ami. I was just wondering, um, in the theorem you specified that you need an LCL task. Um, does it look possible to remove that condition? Uh, I think you use it to, because you don't, this way you don't, consider the identifiers. Uh, so does it look possible to remove that condition? So, uh, hi Fabian. Uh, so first, maybe not all the audience familiar. So LCL is a task that you can check locally. Let's say coloring, it takes maybe log n rounds to uh, compute, but you can check in one round of communication with all your neighbors that you have different color than them. So you can check the coloring is proper in one round. This is LCL, it's problems that you can check locally. And indeed the definitions of LCL sometimes also had to do with the, has to do with the identifiers and so on, but this is not the crucial thing. And our work is specific for LCLs because if you're not asking a, a local problem, say you want a minimum spanning tree, which is not local, then it's not clear, I mean, you don't expect to be able to model it with a small simplicial complex that depends only on the degrees of the nodes. It must depend on the whole system. Uh, so we cannot remove this assumption of LCLs for this specific work. Uh, can we re remove the assumption of ideas? That's a good question. It's very good question. It's very technical I'm, and I'm not sure 
what is the answer? I mean, maybe we could have assumptions about the ideas. I hope this uh, answers your question. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Okay, any other question? Well, if not, then I believe we are done not only with this presentation, but also with the whole session. So I think we can now all unmute and clap and thank all of our speakers. So please do that. Let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. So thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, in the end, so I hope you enjoyed the session. And uh, I also he hope to see you next time uh, personally if a uh, COVID situation arose. So thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.